Hi everyone, this is Patrick Donahoe. This video is a condensed version of the presentation I gave at the 2022 Limitless Financial Freedom Expo in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's titled, One Equation, Two Paths, and Three Principles for Financial Independence. So the first thing I want to, to say is, for those listening who are actually at the event, I want, to, I want you to take a second and just realize the significance of you making a decision to, to be there, right? Because it's the majority of people during this period of time are, they're being leisurely, right? It's the summer, weather's nicer, kids are out of school, they're going on vacation, you know, they're playing golf, uh, they're uh, doing things that are more recreational. But you guys decided to come to really hot Phoenix, Arizona and participate in a conference, right? It's a, it's a big commitment. And I believe you have connected some pieces, right? Because the majority of people want to be financially independent, okay? But how do they go about achieving financial independence, right? They, they think it's by luck. And so they'll play the lottery. Uh, they'll bet on really risky endeavors, right, to to win it big. But you guys have connected that it requires work, but it also requires surrounding yourself with uh, people that are in the minority, those that have actually achieved it and had the experience of doing so, hoping that you could learn and glean and leverage from them ways in which you can accelerate your journey to financial independence. So kudos, kudos to you. Right, coming to that conference, like you put yourself mentally, psychologically, uh, amongst the minority. Now it comes down to implementation, application, and uh, taking action. But it tells me that if you are sacrificing that time, that energy, which you can't get back, money you can get back, but you also sacrifice money. Okay, it shows that you have what it takes to achieve financial uh, independence. That driving force, that that hunger. Right, which in my experience is one of those key variables to obtaining, to achieving what you are really after. So the first thing I'm gonna get into is I want you, I want you to consider something, right? I want you to consider that the biggest obstacle to achieving financial independence okay, isn't like having the right investment or financial plan. It's actually uh, the it's the symbiotic relationship between the reasonable part, a uh, reasonable part of you, and reality. These are two dissimilar parts of who you are. So let me kind of get into it. You know, today we're surrounded by fear and uh, uncertainty, right? Especially after this conference, right? Coming back to what's going on po uh, politically, what's going on socially, what's going on in markets. Right, we're in the middle of a lot of uncertainty. It's dominating the headlines. But I would assert that this is the best time, the best time to pursue the tactics, the ideas, uh, the strategies, okay, and also find these asymmetric risk reward investment opportunities because of how people react to these circumstances. So let me give you an example. A lot of the speakers, mainly with the Rich Dad crew, uh, I have known for well over a decade, and we actually met in 2010 at another conference where we were faculty members. And it was, again, 2010, over 10 years ago, but we were in the middle, right, of the aftermath of 2008 and 2009. People had lost money, lost investments, lost their home, gone bankrupt, for, got foreclosed on. It was some really hairy times, but the it wasn't just the speakers, but the attendees, those that made the decision to go to this conference. And the conference happened to be on a cruise ship of all of all places. But at this conference, it was it was the environment that gave the psych, psychological edge, okay, the hope and the even more drive to do whatever it took to achieve financial independence. And today, I know many of the attendees that were there are beyond financially independent, really successful, regardless okay, of those fears and uncertainties that were dominating the marketplace at the time. So, so keep that in mind, right? They conquered the, this biggest challenge, right, in 
uh, facing and finding opportunity, right? So let me let me kind of unpack reason and reality a little bit. So the challenge, it's recognizing that there's this survival part of our brain that has been there for a long time and it causes irrational behavior and bad decisions. Now, when you position yourself on the right side of those decisions, your world is going to change. That's where the opportunity Now, reason, right, this reasonable side of us is the objective world, right? Primarily math and uh, and science, right? Science, geez, it's it's given way to this miraculous environment that businesses, entrepreneurs, right, they've been able to execute within this uh, framework, right, to to provide us with infinite, uh, you know, information, infinite uh, things to do, right? Uh, infinite videos, movies, entertainment. Uh, they've, I would say, transportation has drastically uh, improved. Um, there's hundreds, thousands of ways to connect with other people. There's an abundance of, of food. And like I said, like infinite in- information. It's almost a paradox of sorts. And, and here's the, you know, it's, it keeps growing. Like it's not stopping, right? The, the train has left the station. So reason, like science, math, uh, economics, right? It, it's this logical part of us that makes sense of uh, the world. If you apply it to finance, right? It's being able to read a financial statement, knowing uh, a, I would say, a pro forma, right? How to read or have a business plan that has different components that give you an idea of like, okay, here's the problem, here's the solution, here's the team, this is the time frame, this is the money. Right. Those are kind of these reasonable, objective things that we can point to to understand an aspect of, of life. Right. In this case, investment uh, or, or business. Okay. This this is the idea behind, you know, making good decisions from a reasonable standpoint. But the symbiotic relationship is recognizing that there's this other side of us that is like getting stimulated right now, that's getting triggered right now based on what's going on in society. As much as we think we make decisions rationally and reasonably, okay, the reality is that our behavior is primarily governed by our biological makeup. Okay, Human beings, like our existence is, we're not around to survive based on math and science. We're not wired for math. We're not wired to do math, okay, or to use science to be alive. We're wired to survive, right? The oldest part of our brain, our biological makeup, is the limbic system, right? It's tens of millions of years old, right? And at this very moment, like you're making a judgment about me, you're analyzing what's going on around you. Stuff's going on inside your body and your body is respi- uh, responding. If it's hot outside, it's causing you to sweat. Your body is saying, here, here's some uh, you know, water so you cool down. You're looking if there's, you, you don't recognize this consciously, consciously, but your body is like, there could be something in the bushes. There could be something over there. There could be something that's of danger. It's looking out for the shit that can kill you. Okay, and it does so without you even really being conscious of it. Okay, so you got to recognize that that operating system is going on uh, behind the scenes. It's happening whether whether you like it or not. I would also say that it has a tendency to be parasitic, right? And wants to consume everything. There's never there's never enough, right? So it's it's a really interesting. Uh, I would say side of human beings that rarely goes acknowledged. But once you acknowledge that it's happening, now you can start to, you're not going to get rid of it. First off, you can try, but it's just part of your makeup. So you're not going to get rid of it, but it's having this understanding that there must be a symbiotic relationship between reason and reality, the logical part of your makeup and how you analyze things and the physiological, right, or biological makeup, which is wired to survive. Okay, we're, we're sentient beings in a sense that experience life not as objective equations, but through our subjective senses that are designed to keep us safe and designed to keep us alive, okay? So successful wealth building, as I said, is like managing or understanding the relationship between these two dissimilar parts of you, reason and reality, and having a strategy for them to work together. 
So I'll give you a quick example of what happens when you don't have these two sides balanced. Okay, so there's a, a research firm that's based out of Boston, Massachusetts, and they're called Dalbar. And Dalbar has been around for multiple decades. And what they do is they primarily analyze investment uh, returns, but not from like an index return, okay? Whether it's the S&P or the Dow or the NASDAQ, they don't measure that. They measure actual investor returns based on their behavior. So most know that, you know, indexes uh, have between, you know, if it's a bond index, it's lower. If it's an equities index, it's higher. If it's tech, if it's big cap, small cap, there's lots of different indices, but they all range between an average of five to 10% over the last 30 years. But the actual investor returns, according to Dalbar, has been in the three percentages like in the threes for decades, almost since the beginning. So why? It's because rationally speaking, reason says buy low and sell high. Okay. But reality, when it sets in, okay, in the moment, because of this like stuff going on in the background, it compels people to buy high because they have the fear of missing out and then sell low which is they have the fear of losing everything. That's and that ultimately is what ends up happening. Okay, the idea behind again just where people are and like the way in which they make decisions when life goes sideways both presents things for you to be conscious of so you don't make those irrational decisions, but on the other side of the equation is opportunity. Okay? Now, most people were all, and I include myself in this, like we've been, we were conditioned financially speaking, right, to base our financial future uh, purely based on reason, right? If we save this much and earn this return for this period of time, then we're going to be able to retire in, you know, 23 years, four months and two days or something like that, right? That's the rational side of like what we've been told to do financially. Okay. It doesn't account for all the stuff that happens in life that can derail that, which inevitably happens and inevitably happens more than once. Okay. But the minority, again, going to the beginning, the minority has, have figured out a way uh, to establish their wealth strategy, their financial strategy to account for reality, personal disruptions like health, okay, relationship, um, you know, economic disruptions like tax changes, inflation, uh, you know, interest rates, uh, but also to capitalize on lucrative opportunities that present themselves. Okay, they have a strategy to behave when reality happens. So let me give you an example. This is from my book. Hope you guys got a, a copy of this. Heads I win, tails uh, you lose. Um, I had the, you know, in there, I tell a story about this uh, really famous transplant surgeon that I had the opportunity of working with over the last uh, decade plus. And one of the, the first times we met when we were designing strategy is he, it was right after this 2008, 2009 crisis. And he had made an investment in a syndication and the syndication was taken over by the SEC for fraud. Um, and went into receiver receivership. All the investors were were freaking out. Much of the assets were, you know, the money that was initially in that fund were gone, uh, either spent or taken or just w- weren't worth anything. But there were some, there were a few assets left. And so the investors in this fund were like pressuring the receiver to just sell everything, get rid of everything, get as much as possible back as soon as possible. And one of the assets that we discovered as I was working with my client was this unencumbered uh, penthouse in Miami. And, and this was uh, something he, he knew that was, I guess it was, you know, right around the time he invested is when they purchased this, uh, this penthouse, but he knew that there was value there. But again, all the investors wanted out. So we strategized 
Um, and as his financial advisor, you know, we, we figured out ways to create some liquidity so he could buy out this unencumbered property from the fund. And he got it for 400, I think just over $450,000. Okay. Now this was again, a penthouse in Miami in some high rise back in 2010. He was able to sell that just a few years later. Uh, and for more than double, which made up for his initial investment loss uh, in that fund. And, uh, but if you guys, you know, well, looking at where prices would be, you know, today, uh, it would definitely be worth like two, three times what he sold it for. But again, it's, you know, that was then, that was the opportunity, that was his objective. But what I wanted, to do, wanted you to get out of that example is that opportunity is always on the other side of irrational behavior, okay? It's always on the other side of that reality. So my point is, before I move on, like right now, societies, economies, it's getting chaotic. Uh, irrational behavior is reigning. Be on the side that responds, not on the side that reacts, so this next piece I think is really important, right? Uh, financial independence is subjective. You know, another obstacle I've experienced uh, personally, right? But also seeing the lives of clients is knowing what financial is independence is uh, for you, okay? So I want you to consider that financial independence is first a way of being before any measurable end. So let me give you a, let me give you a quick story. Uh, this is a relatively famous story. It's not, not necessarily mine, but it's of this fisherman in uh, Cabo San Lucas. So which is at the tip of Baja, California. It is a you know really popular destination for sport fishing. So the story goes, this fisherman had worked many years you know, on other charters to afford his own boat, got his own boat. He does a charter three days a week only one charter a day, which is between three and four hours. And what he does is he has it all set up. It's an amazing experience. He's done with the charter, goes home, is able to uh, walk his kids home from school, have lunch with his wife, and then have dinner as a family as they get old, or as, um, uh, as the day winds, uh, winds down. Okay? And it's this ideal life that he has. And one day this Goldman Sachs uh, banker is on vacation, uh, this investment banker, and he goes to the fisherman, uh, you know, to do the charter. Has an amazing experience, catch a bunch of fish, right? And he's just blown away. It's one of the best vacations he's ever had. And he goes to the fisherman and says, listen, like, you're only doing a charter three days a week, and you're only doing one charter a day. Like, and he got some numbers from the fisherman, and he said, listen, if you, if you do two charters a day and work six days a week, you'll be able to afford another boat in just a couple of months. And if you have two going on and you can train, so it's the same experience, okay, you can train that crew. Soon you'll be able to afford five and then 10. And once you get to 10, then we can get some financing and buy another 10. And when you get to that point, that fleet will produce enough income where we can take your business public, okay? And you'll, you'll have all of this money come in. And then he asked the fisherman, if you had that amount of money, like if that, if, if you had that come into your bank account, like how would your life change? And the fisherman thought about it for a second. And he's like, no, not much would change. <laughs> but all the effort, right, and change and all the things he would have to do in order to get to that end, okay, would disrupt the life that he already had. So my point is, you got to understand what financial independence is for you. You know, I've discovered over the years working with people at all levels of wealth and financial situations that money does not solve uh, your human problems, like your life problems. It solves your money problems, okay? But it doesn't make you free and fulfilled. So step one is getting clear about the results you want. And then, you know, getting clear about why you really want them and then clear about about why you really want that, okay? Sometimes it takes a few levels to really get clear about what you're after. And then once you're there, once you understand, then it's determining, okay, what financial situation must you be in in order to live that way, okay? So that's another huge step is defining what it is. 
So where did all of this come from? I'll just give you my b- brief background. I didn't just wake up one day and, and you know, understand life this, uh, this way. Uh, in 2002, I did an a, a, a internship at the Hartford, Connecticut Board of Education, specifically in the bilingual department. I, I speak fluent Spanish. My parents were both teachers. And so a career as a language teacher seemed logical at the time. Now, during the internship, I had dinner with a friend who was about to go back to school. He was giddy about these two books that he uh, had just read and he actually brought me copies. And here are the two books. The first one is Millionaire Next Door and the second one is Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Millionaire Next Door, Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Now, I read The Millionaire Next Door first, okay? And those who have read that book wouldn't be surprised that I started taking my own lunch to uh, the lunchroom, instead of going out to eat, I started drinking water from the water fountain so I wasn't using the vending man- uh, machines and was really excited that, you know, the $10 a day that I was going to save would grow with compound interest and, you know, and I eventually have like 500 bucks after 30 years if you factor in inflation, right? So I went now to the book that made the biggest difference, right? So after, you know, Sure, I've read Millionaire Next Door. Being in the lunchroom, I now cracked open this book. My whole world changed because of this book. Now, the reason why it changed is because I would say it's like the ideal environment for that paradigm shift to happen, right? I became acutely aware of my physical surroundings. I would say psychological surroundings as well. I was at a board of education of all places, public education. Um, And I was looking around and it was like the living, breathing epitome of the poor dad paradigm. Okay. And I was there with, you know, as a kind of a fish with a lure and hook in my mouth, not yet set, but about to be set. So I remember looking around and started connecting all of these dots and I concluded that was not the life that I wanted. Uh, So my, you know, my grandfather was the benefactor of his grandkids Uh, education. So I did go through and finish school, but I got my formal training in math and economics. And what I learned uh, with math and economics is, is kind of pure reason, right? It's math and economics are a way to make sense of the world, okay, objectively to validate or invalidate uh, opinions, hypotheses, assumptions, right? It's to prove or disprove as well. So that skill set alongside of the rich dad paradigm has helped me navigate uh, the, my career and the difference uh, my firm and I have been able to make in the lives of clients for, you know, for 20 years now. So one of the first milestones of this, of this journey, right, was I found this massive gap in the financial services industry. You know, the, the client-facing world of financial planning seems to be based on math and economics, which in large part it, it is. That's their sales pitch. Right. If you save this much, you earn these averages. This is what life will look like in in 30 years. But it did not account for reality. So then I went on the search and I discovered financial strategies, wealth strategies that were more principled in nature uh, and mathematically sound, but also worked alongside the rich dad paradigm. These were financial strategies that the majority of financial planners did not advocate uh, as part of their recommendations. Uh, And so I decided to start my own firm in 2007 called Paradigm Life. Now, shortly after, I got the business legal marketing experience of a lifetime because that's when, you know, 2008, 2009, everything like changed, especially from a financial perspective. Those were some pretty dark times. I saw the dark side of creditors. I saw the dark side of banks, attorneys, investments, investment syndicators. It was a... It was ugly, but with a lot of work, a lot of answers to prayers, I made it out by uh, the skin of my teeth. Uh, But that invaluable education shaped what we were offering for clients even more. And since then, we've served uh, almost 8,000 clients around the country at all levels of wealth. Uh, But I love, you know, I love working with this type of crowd, the real estate investors, the entrepreneurs, business owners, those that have this drive to be free, be independent, not just be part of the status quo, okay, and then subsequently make a difference with their lives and the lives of other people as well. So I was super grateful to be at the conference with you last week. 
Uh, and for those that I didn't meet, maybe we'll cross paths in the future. But for those that I did, it was, it was awesome. It's so invigorating. So let me get into three principles that I have discovered that are paramount to align your financial life uh, with in order to be financial, financially independent. Okay, the first two, so certainty, uncertainty, and then uh, independence equals production. So how I like to explain certainty and uncertainty is based on this graphic right here, which is a kind of a symmetrical roots and, and, uh, and tree, right? Trunk, branches, and, uh, and, and leaves, fruit, if, if you will. So I like to look at it symmetrical because the part of the tree that is exposed to uncertainty Okay, when the winds of time, when you know life happens, is above ground. But what creates strength and resilience and flexibility is what's below ground, okay, which is that foundation, that root structure. Okay, so growing wealth, growing toward financial independence requires that there is symmetry between those two sides of the tree. Okay, so as you pursue uh, uncertainty, whether it's investment, whether it's business, whether it's entrepreneurship, okay, the, the idea is that you can actually uh, handle and manage more uncertainty as you establish a strong foundation. Now, there's so many different parts of that foundation, but I feel that that foundation, that infrastructure, that framework has economic value, massive economic value, because you can equate more certainty to the amount of uncertainty that you can withstand. And that uncertainty is where all of the opportunity is. It's the realm of opportunity, okay? So establishing that framework is paramount and ensuring that there's symmetry is powerful. So how do you do that with your financial, financial life? Okay, this is where we look at two paths. So the first path is, well, first off, like all, everyone, all people, but especially investors, business owners, entrepreneurs that, that put themselves in precarious situations where there is a lot of uncertainty, okay, they're definitely on these two paths. But the first path is the protection path, okay? And now what I mean by protection is protection from the unanticipated uh, events, right? Unanticipated events of life, like uh, the, the primary ones, like liability, disability, uh, death. Uh, and that's about, you know, I would say the, uh, the type and the amount uh, and the positioning of that protection. And the second path is the wealth accumulation path. Uh, and that's about capital, right? It's capital for your short-term needs, uh, for your long-term needs, like paying for kids' education, especially for your financially independent lifestyle, okay? And the reason why you protect is based on this curve. It's because of how wealth works over time, right? You don't put your first $10,000 into an investment and it just suddenly becomes a million dollars, right? It took time. You had to keep depositing money, keep earning interest. So what we say is that wealth accumulation is most effective later at the end, even though you have to start today, okay? The end result, it happens down the road. Now, you don't own this curve, right? You don't have a right to the curve. Life is not linear, okay? There are all sorts of things that can interfere with having that curve materialize successfully. So let's mention a few of those, right? And this right here represents that when there's disruption, it impacts that curve. And sometimes the curve has to start over multiple times. That's why we want to protect first, because if that protection's not in place, then you have to start over time and time and time again. Okay, so let's talk about, you know, whether it's job loss, disability, lawsuit, divorce, death, health, market correction. Um, all of those are, I would even say a possibility. There's one of these, there's something that's going to interfere with that wealth term, uh, wealth uh, curve growing over the course of time. So this is what my team and I have learned after thousands of clients, hundreds of thousands of man hours designing financial strategies over the last uh, 15 years is being able to have this protection path in place. Now, what does that protection path look like? What, how does that impact the wealth strategy? like adequate liquidity, a living financial statement, you know, a way to objectively measure the risk you're taking with not just 
one investment or two investments, but all of your assets. Uh, financial education is also an important piece. And part of that is being able to read a pro forma uh, it's, and understand a pro forma and then do due diligence on the pro forma by asking the right questions and verifying sources. It's having the right insurances in place. It's having asset protection okay, if, if that's warranted, which it always is. Uh, it's a tax strategy, right? It's having a wealth strategy that can capitalize on these uncertain times by having liquidity and being able to capitalize on those opportunities. So this is something that we, as far as carrying out uh, our mission and carrying out what I've talked about previously, this is how it happens. This is how we design wealth strategy. So now let's move to the independence equation, right? How do you measure if you're financially uh, independent? Obviously, there's a common one, which is like your passive income equals your expenses. That's mostly common. But what I've found after working with people is that that equation does not create independence. Okay, It solves the money problems, but it doesn't create fulfillment and independence. Okay, What I found you know, creates fulfillment and independence Okay is what I call production, right? Which is meaningful work. Now, this is a saying by Ken McElroy, business creates liquidity, real estate creates wealth. But business or production continues to provide liquidity to continually invest, to continually improve, enhance, amplify your lifestyle, okay? But it also provides a sense of fulfillment because business production, right? There's something about, being able to take what's inside of you, gifts, training, all the experiences that you've had and being able to provide value to someone else in which they value that and subsequently give you money in return. Okay, so the equation is investment cash flow plus meaningful work are greater than your lifestyle uh, expenses. Okay, now meaningful work comes from the idea when life comes first, work comes second. It also has to do with you know you being able to find something inside of you that's of value to others. That's another important dynamic. So there's another example in the book that I, where I talk about this uh, independence equation. And it's a couple that I've worked with for um, over a decade now. And uh, they were both in the software world they worked really hard. That's a very demanding profession, but both of them made great money. They got to executive level positions and they didn't want to, to work as hard anymore, but they didn't see another option based on their skill set. So as we got into it, you know, they were approaching uh, the amount of cash flow. They were approaching the things kind of balanced out symmetrically. Okay, they were they were on the brink of just the financial side of financial uh, independence. But what pushed them over the edge is just this idea here, is pursuing and finding meaningful work, wherever it might be. And they finally found some opportunities to be consultants, to do some uh, part-time work where they can leverage their skill set and make a lot of money doing it. Not as much as they were making before, but their investment cash flow supported the rest that is the example I've seen time and time and time again as far as what leads to financial independence. And the best part is this equation invariably allows a person to achieve financial independence sooner than having all of your investment cash flow pay for your life's expenses completely. So again, the idea here, right, as I kind of conclude my thoughts, right, it's Again, finding those areas that bring you fulfillment, finding those professions, for finding uh, you know, also jobs and opportunities that allow you to live first and then uh, work, work second. So let me just show you as I kind of conclude my thoughts, an empirical analysis that I did several, several years ago where I analyzed three people. Uh, person A was making $100,000 of income, they were investing 10% of that income, okay? And they pursued financial education in the realm of investing. So because of that, they were able to earn a 10% compounded return. And over 30 years, okay, they grew their assets to $2.5 million. Now, person B, okay, 
also $100,000 of income starting out. They were saving 10% of their income in a 5% savings ROI, so much less than this 10% compounded return, but they focused their financial education on personal development. And instead of finding a way to grow their assets by 10% a year, they found a way to grow their income by 10% per year. The end result is $11,500,000. Now we'll go to person C. $100,000 of income, invested 10% of their income because they focused on both. They focused on personal development, growing their income by 10% a year. They also focused their, their, invest, uh, their financial education around investment, so they were able to earn a compounded return of 10% per year. And that end result, $19,760,000. So this represents mathematically the difference between those focused purely on having their investments cover their expenses okay, versus someone who dedicates to both their personal development, growing the amount of value they're able to provide the world in the marketplace, and then subsequently focusing on financial education as well in the realm of investing. That's the ideal outcome. But even focusing here as far as personal development is concerned shows you that there is a massive difference okay, as far as outcome, uh, as far as outcome. All right, so the key to lasting wealth, as I just went through those examples, is when your end goals financially are based on uh, one option or two options, those rarely produce the environment in which you can be financially independent, okay? I've discovered that having uh, multiple options is a key to achieving the financial life that you want. One option is not a choice, two options are a dilemma, three options produce a viable decision. What I had covered previously as far as personal development is concerned and focusing on ways in which you can increase your income, not just increase the rate of return you're getting on assets, okay, shows that there's options there. Okay, being able to have that type of professional life where you're valued in the marketplace gives you tremendous options. Financial education, specifically around one or two investment strategies, those investment strategies, the taxation, the structure could change over the course of time, which requires you to change. So therefore, basing your entire financial future on just one or two things, okay, it pigeonholes people, it puts them, paints them into a corner where if things don't work out, they're outside of their control, they're not left with a viable decision. Okay, everyone, thank you a lot for being here, for watching this, uh, this video. Uh, you know, the goal of my firm is to help uh, those that are in the majority become part of the minority. You've taken massive steps to put yourself amongst the minority, to educate yourself, to find inspiration, to find ideas. Uh, and that's what we help people do, is establish a wealth strategy that it allows them to have an even more meaningful life today and a financially independent future. Uh, thanks for listening. This is a way which you guys can get in touch. There also should be some information in the, uh, the email. Uh, but that's it. Thank you so much for learning today. I'm so grateful for your time and your focus. Uh, happy investing and cheers to your financial independence.